So thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, this year marks the 27th anniversary of the culmination of the Bosnian genocide in the town of Srebrenica, in which over 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys were murdered in what the United Nations has described as the worst atrocity on European soil since the Second World War. One of the key lessons from Bosnia is that peace is more than just the absence of war. Peace is to establish an active culture of living in peace in the world and our everyday actions through which war is made less likely. We're so fortunate today to have amazing speakers. Selma Porsa, and hopefully I'm saying that correctly, was born in Benja Luka, Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. During the aggression on Bosnia, Selma and her family became refugees. They spent most of the war in Sarajevo while it was under siege. In 1999, Selma and her family immigrated to the United States where she attended the University of Washington. Selma holds a bachelor's degree in, of business administration with a major in accounting and a master's of professional accounting with a major in tax. Selma worked in the public accounting sector for over a decade between Price Waterhouse Corporation and Deloitte. However, earlier this year, she decided to leave public accounting and accepted the position of executive director of the Congress of Bosniaks of North America. Her experience as a refugee contributed significantly to the desire to participate in community activism and her unwavering commitment to social responsibility. She has served and is currently serving on the board of several nonprofit organizations. Our other guest speaker today is Sonia Elazar, who is a descendant of an old Sephardic family, which after being expelled from Spain, arrived in the Ottoman Empire and has been living in Sarajevo for centuries. She was born immediately after World War II as a refugee in the city of Zenica, where her parents and older sister were protected and helped by the local miners and thus survived the Holocaust. Sonia received her education in Sarajevo, where she studied economics and then worked for Energ Energovinest company as the manager of the Department for Export and Non-Ferrous Materials until 1992. She lived in, oh my goodness, I'm never gonna be able to say this, Grabif, Grabifza, an occupied part of Sarajevo, in one day, she lost her job, her apartment, and everything she owned. After moving to her mother's apartment, it was burnt down on May 2nd, 1992, during an attack on Sarajevo by a Yugoslav National Army, and she was a refugee again. Sonia volunteered at a Jewish community center from 1992 to 96, and founded a women's club, Bohrita, which took care of distribution of food and clothing and a Sunday school, which once a week gathered children of the city who were hiding in the basements with no normalcy in their lives. After the war ended, Sonia wrote a book from the photo album of Bosnian Shepherds to keep the mem memory of generations of Sephardic families that lived in Sarajevo for centuries, and most of whom were killed only because they were Jewish. Unfortunately, from 1992 to 1996, the same history repeated itself. People were guilty for being born with an identity that was not liked by others. And our wonderful mon moderator, Dr. Mehenez Afridi, who is on our board of trustees, and we're so grateful to have her here. Thank you so much, Mehenez, for joining us today, for our speakers for joining us today. I did want to mention um, Tahia Vakalo, who is our executive director at the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, sends her greetings to all of you and deepest regrets that she cannot be here today. Uh, Tahia's daughter is in the hospital for a bone marrow transplant, and due to those circumstances and the difficulty of this subject material, um, she did not feel she could do this program justice by being here today. So she sends her greetings and best wishes to all of you and thanks all of you for joining us today. Mehnez, could you um, tell us a little bit about your most recent, recent trip to Sarajevo, and then we'll introduce our speakers. Sure. Um, hello, everybody. I'm really honored to be here. Um, so I just want to say a few things about uh, Sarajevo and also Srebrenica because it's very important and very crucial to me. I've been going there since 2016. 
um, at the anniversary, which is technically July 11th. So it was the 27th, as Nicole said. And um, for me, it's really important as a Holocaust and Islamic scholar to look at the Bosnian genocide, but also to help the Bosnian people and to help them elevate their voice. I'm not Bosnian, as most of you know, I'm from Pakistan um, and I'm American. So I, I feel that it's really important for other people to take interest in this genocide, but also how it's important for us, especially people who study the Holocaust, to recognize that there was indeed the worst atrocity on European yes. soil since World War II. What's interesting is that Selma is Bosnian Muslim and Sonia is Jewish Bosnian. And that is what draws me to Sarajevo. Sarajevo is very interfaith. It's very open. It's very multicultural. It's really like home for me. I can hear the call of prayer, the azan. I can look at the synagogue and I can hear the church bells. And to me, that is fundamentally important as a person who believes in different faiths, but also maintains my own faith. So I wanted to just say that this time when I was there, I gave a workshop on religious side which is talking about how Jews and Muslims have been persecuted just because of their religion. Um, what's, what's shameful is that while the Bosnian genocide was going on, it was called ethnic cleansing. And some may argue that it's ethnicity, but they were all Muslims that were, that were killed. Um, during the Holocaust, we know that 12 million people were killed, but 6 million of them were Jews and they were killed because they were Jewish and had Jewish blood and ancestry. These are very important concepts and why they're important to me, why I'm doing this work with a organization there in Bosnia and have partnered with them is because we have the same issues today in the United States. We are still seeing a kind of uh, religious racism, especially against Jews and then Muslims, a sort of pushback uh, against immigration and diversity and so we cannot do enough of this work today. The other thing I just want to mention is that thousands of people from Bosnia and Herzegovina came to the Srebrenica uh, anniversary of the Serbian massacre. And this was uh, the 27th. And I just want to mention also, and Nicole said, Serbian forces summarily executed more than 8,000 Bosnian men and boys, about 100,000 people including women and children during Bosnia's 1992 to 1995. I've also done work on sexuality, sexual violence against Muslim and Jewish women during genocide, which is also very crucial and important when we look at what's going on in terms of gender and, and women's rights. Families of 50 recently identified victims and we rebury their loved ones. And after almost three decades, imagine waiting for that moment to do. To, to bury your own son, your husband, your uncle, your father, <clears throat> sorry. The Srebrenica ma massacre is Europe's only acknowledged genocide since the Holocaust and is the only one legally defined as such by many countries and two United Nations courts. And then tribunal courts in the Balkan countries have sentenced about 50 Bosnian Serbs a wartime officials to more than 700 years in prison. Leaders of Serb Republic of Bosnia or Republic of Spreska, however, continue to downplay or even deny the 1995 uh, Srebrenica massacre and hail Karadzic and Mladic as national heroes. And this was going on while I was there in memory of the Bosnians, that about 20 kilometers away from Srebrenica, there was this um, tribute uh, to the heroism of Mladic, who was in charge of killing these young boys and men um, <clears throat> in 1995. So with that, I want to just give it over to the speakers and say how important this event is, how it's important that we remember. And I know this as somebody who studies the Holocaust, that we constantly remember and give tribute to these people. Thank you. Thank you, Mehnaz. I really appreciate that. Um, I do want to say just before we jump into our speakers, we want to thank uh, Fern Finkel for sponsoring this event. Um, these events could not happen without our board of trustees and our sponsors. So thank you so much, Fern. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Selma and Sonia. Selma, would you like to start? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Nicole. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, shalom and assalamu alaikum. My name is Selma Porcha, and I am the executive director of the Congress of Bosniaks of North America. Uh, thank you, first of all, to the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom for inviting me to participate in this important discussion. Uh, it's an honor to be surrounded by women who are working towards peace, uh, education, and reconciliation. I think um, we need more women having these conversations. So I am absolutely, I, I love your organization and your motto. Um, as I know, our audience is made up of a diverse group of people and not everyone knows what's going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina right now. I would like to start by giving everyone context. Uh, as we're gathered to speak on this very important topic and to remember the victims of the Srebrenica genocide, tensions are once again rising in Bosnia. Uh, the international community through the Office of the High Representative plan on presenting a discriminatory anti-Islamic, anti-Jewish, anti-Roma law in Bosnia that would once again treat us as second class citizens. Uh, this law is supposed to take effect on August 1st. So I just want to share that for those who think that Srebrenica happened a long time ago. We said never again, therefore it cannot happen again. Um, you know, if this law passes, I do not dare predict what will happen in Bosnia. So I just, I want to tell you that so that we all know that what we're talking about today is um, very relevant with current events in Bosnia, and, and I think that just gives it more weight. Um, so I just wanted to share that before I start. Um, with that, I, I'm so glad the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom organized the program to pay tribute to the victims of the Srebrenica genocide. As I mentioned, I myself am not from Srebrenica, but I am a Bosnian Muslim, and Srebrenica would have been all of us if the aggressors had their way. And I hope I will demonstrate that today by sharing my experience and just the effect Srebrenica had on me as an individual and as a Bosnian Muslim. Uh, at the end of the day, what happened in Srebrenica is a crime against humanity uh, and a crime against every decent person on this planet and against all of us. So I like to say we are all Srebrenica. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm originally from Banja Luka, uh, which is currently part of the entity of Republika Srpska. Um, and uh, my father owned a bakery in the middle of the city before the war, and my mom's family owned um, a, a very sizable farm. Um, and before the war, Banja Luka was a multi-ethnic city, um, just like Sarajevo, uh, where everyone lived in peace. Um, it, you know, the diversity in Bosnia is sometimes hard for people to understand. You know, in most countries, there's a majority and a minority. In, in Bosnia, you had a split of you know, 34%, 40%, 50% of Catholic, uh, Orthodox, Muslim. You had a really not, a good population of, of, of the Jewish, Sephardic uh, uh, Jewish uh, community, which came over from Spain. Um, so, you know, it was, it was, the diversity was at a level where, you know, the city was called uh, uh, Jerusalem Pico or, or small Jerusalem. Um, so, you know, when the war started, everyone was kind of in shock. There's no way, you know, your neighbors are going to, are going to turn on you. You've been living with them in peace for, you know, for, for years and years, for decades, as far as, as far back as you can remember, right? Um, for your generation, right? But people weren't aware the generation after generation, this kept happening in, in this part of the world. And I think there's a consciousness of that now more so than ever. Um, so I was six years old when we were forcefully expelled from Banja Luka in 1993. Um, there were a lot of warning signs when all of that happened. People would say things like, oh, you know, there's a police van uh, going around picking up men, picking up boys. Um, you know, men and boys should not be out on the street. Women need to go to the stores, to the markets. Um, you know, don't let the men out of the house. And, you know, of course, I mean, this is ridiculous, right? So a lot of men uh, did get taken. We knew that they were being taken to concentration camps or forced to be serving in the, in the what they call the Yugoslav army or, uh, you know, what was the, the army of, of, of the Serbian army of Bosnian Serbs. Um, and so my dad decided that, you know, he wasn't, he, he wasn't okay with either one of those options and that we were going to leave. So we sold everything we could uh, and boarded buses leaving for, um, leaving Banja Luka. We were actually exchanged for a group of Serbian refugees in Travnik who were leaving, you know, parts that were majority Muslim because their government had told them to do that. Um, so uh, my brother at the time was three years old. So I was six, he was three. Um, and I have this picture engraved in my mind that I don't think I will ever forget. And that is, you know, us boarding the bus and our, four, you know, four grandparents who were all alive at the time, um, sitting outside the bus and, and just waving as the bus departs. And they just kept waving, right? The bus is leaving and they kept waving for as long as they could see the bus. 
Um, so that was really emotional for me. And I still remember it really clearly, even though I was only six years old. Um, so in March of 1993, we are leaving Banja and we head for Travnik, which is um, uh, you know another city in Bosnia. And we arrived to chaos. I mean, we arrived on buses. There were trucks full of people arriving, um, people trying to sell their stuff to go elsewhere. Um, I mean, I can't even just imagine thousands of people in one place, just packed, uh, trying to figure out what to do. It was pure chaos. Um, and we were sent to a warehouse with hundreds of thin mattresses on the floor um, in straight lines and just told to kind of find a spot. And UN soldiers were walking around handing out these brown bags of, you know, goodies, crackers, whatever was in there, I can't remember. Um, and, you know, Travnik was, um, we came close to death on multiple occasions in Travnik. We first were in a, ref so after that warehouse, they found refugee camps. And one of them was a university that we stayed at. And we stayed in um, uh, classrooms, but the classrooms obviously had windows. And so anytime there was a bombing, you know, they would tell us run into the hallways, run into the staircases so that the shrapnel from the grenades around the university doesn't, you know, shoot through and, and harm people. Um, and I remember clearly uh, one time we were sitting in, in the staircase. And again, I, at this point, I'm, you know, still, I think six and a half or something. I remember clearly people talking about, you know, this is it, they're close. We're, you know, we need to prepare for the worst case scenario as we're all packed into this hallway, uh, into the staircase. And um, a little while later, there's a banging on the door and we, we thought, oh my God, they're gonna come in, they're gonna slaughter all of us. Turns out that it was the Bosnian army. They had actually broken through the, the enemy lines, came in and there was a soldier walking up the staircase giving candy to the children in the staircase. So again, this is all kind of emotional, I apologize. Anyway, so um, from there, you know, we realized it was really dangerous. We're constantly under attack. So they move us to a daycare facility in a place called Kalbunar uh, in, in Travnik. And we stayed there for a period of time until um, one morning the place was mined. Um, so our, one of our men would always walk out before the women and the children and, and check the surroundings. And they found living trap mines right outside um, of the exit to the building. And at that point, my dad said, okay, this is, we can't, we can't stay in the city. We need to go elsewhere. So at that time, uh, that was June of 1993, we decided to go to Zenica. And in Zenica, our refugee camp was a movie theater. Imagine just a theater filled with rows and rows of beds, um, bunk beds stacked right up against each other so that people just had a place to sleep. Um, just to give you kind of an overview of the conditions, we had uh, one bathroom and we had one stove for 300 people to share. So you can imagine tensions ran high. This was not the best conditions, especially for children to be in. People did their best. They started schools for little kids to try to, you know, do, do fun things and not think about the war. But we were under constant attack. We had no food. We had no water. We had no electricity. We had no heat. Um, I remember my dad making a makeshift stove from a, a, a metal bucket that he found and brought from somewhere, God knows where, on a bicycle when he came to visit us from being on the front lines and made my mom a makeshift stove so that she didn't have to share with 300 other people. And of course, then everybody in our, around us got to use that stove too. So it took a little bit of weight off of, off of that main cooking area. Um, the bombings were constant and the food was divided to us um, from a uh, soup kitchen. So people would, you know, these organizations who were working on this would come bring big buckets of food um, and then serve it to us. And it was mostly water um, with, you know, a little bit of beans or something in there, but something to have sustenance, right? Uh, the bread was filled with rice. You didn't have enough flour to make full bread. So you mix bread and rice in order to make flour. Um, and so, but I remember a bombing very clearly, and, and this, um, in, in my mind, this kind of is like a movie scene. It's, it's unbelievable to think that this is actually a memory. Um, we were outside, playing outside this theater with kids. I mean, these are refugee camps, right? These are civilians, unarmed civilians, and they would intentionally bomb these places with the intention to kill as many civilians as possible. Um, so a bomb flew, and I just remember dust 
and rocks flying everywhere and smoke and people screaming and running. And I don't even, I ran too. You just kind of run with everybody else because as a kid, you have no idea what's going on. And, you know, we ran into, into the theater and sheltered under the stairs. That's where everybody would kind of go because that was the safest place with shrapnel. Um, and, and so this was a constant in this refugee camp, um, snipers, bombings, you know, even though um, you, you always thought, okay, maybe this is a safer area, but they were everywhere. I mean, they had spread out everywhere and there were battles being, being fought everywhere around the country. Um, so we endured these conditions for nine months. I remember my brother and I got chicken pox, you know, lice were very, very common. Everybody had lice. You had no way to prevent it in the conditions because there was no running water. People had to shower once. I don't even remember how often, but I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't waste water on a shower when you had no water to drink, right? So um, that, that's the kind of conditions that these refugee camps um, were in. So in March of 1994, um, we decide to head to Sarajevo. And uh, this was because I had an aunt who lived in Sarajevo with her two children. And she said, look, you know, you guys are living in these terrible conditions. I have this apartment in Sarajevo. It's not much, but it, it, it's better than what you have. And I understand that Sarajevo, you know, is not the best place to be, but let's at least we'll be together. Whatever happens, happens, just, just come over here. So we decide to, to leave Zenitsa and to head to Sarajevo. Um, and the trip took seven days. So we had to take the mountains, the, the, the roads to Sarajevo were all closed. Sar Sarajevo was under a complete shutdown under siege. They, it was surrounded. Um, and we boarded trucks. So they loaded us into the back of, of trucks and sent us over the mountains. I just wanna remind everyone, this is March of 1994. This is winter in, in Bosnia. I mean, the, the mountains in Bosnia at this time, I don't even know how they made the roads possible to be completely honest. I mean, this is snow and ice and uh, terrible cold conditions on the mountains. I remember, um, you know, there were trucks sliding, right? These, these roads that are on the mountains are not meant to, to withhold trucks carrying all these people. So I remember trucks sliding off into the ditch and other trucks picking them up. Um, obviously we had no food, whatever we brought with us, that's what we could eat the entire seven days. So we had to ration constantly close to enemy lines. I remember there were times when they would just walk in and say, you know, shh, nobody, you, you cannot speak. You cannot say a word and we're kids, right? You cannot say a word, they're close. They can hear us from here. We can hear them. We, we have to be really quiet. Um, and this was a constant and, and, and it was freezing. I remember at one point, I don't, I'm, I don't know if I fall asleep or if I've passed out from the cold, my parents were laying on top of us to keep us cold because we had no blankets um, to keep ourselves cold as we were heading over the mountains um, to, to, to come to Sarajevo. And we entered the Sarajevo through the tunnel, the famous tunnel of hope, right? The tunnel that actually sustained the city during, during the siege. And I just want to point out, you know, in Sarajevo, what was under attack was actually the diversity and the multi-confessionalism of that city. Um, you know, we all lived in peace. You had a church, a mosque, and a synagogue in a block radius from each other. And, and, and there was no issue with that um, other than, you know, unless you were a far right kind of fascist Nazi type ideology, then of course you took issue with that kind of diversity and that kind of coexistence. Um, in Sarajevo, you know, there were snipers everywhere. People had to figure out ways like, where can we walk? Where can we not walk? Because if you go that way, there's that hill and there's a sniper that'll get you. If you go this way, you know, they might be able to throw a grenade. Uh, uh, literally every single step of life in Sarajevo was um, a step of survival, figuring out what you can do to survive and how to do it. We had no water, no electricity, no heating. Um, people burned what they could to stay warm to collect water, and I'm sure Sonia will share her perspective on this as well, but to collect water, we did one of two things. Either we went to the closest spring, filled up a bucket and brought it back, and that's what we had to drink, um, or they would bring um, these truck tankers and park them in neighborhoods filled with water that they would fill up at these water sources and then distribute them throughout the city. And when that happened, people were just up. It doesn't matter what time, they usually happen at night because you have to avoid the snipers. But it doesn't matter what time the truck arrived, people could hear it. They would run down with canisters and come back up the stairs as many times as we could to fill up our tub, to fill up whatever thing we could that, that could sustain water so that we could have water until the next batch of water is available. 
Um, so the, the conditions, uh, you know, in Sarajevo were awful and, you know, everything was under, we were under embargo, right? So um, one night I recall that I wanted to share with everyone, I woke up uh, to the sound of grenades and this was very common, you know, you're sleeping and then you wake up to these crashing, insane, you know, noises. And uh, at this point I was eight, my brother was five. And I remember uh, I looked around, my mom wasn't in the apartment. My dad obviously was on the front line. So he was not often with us. He had to be, he had to be uh, with the army. Um, but I, my, when my mom was gone, I would kind of freak out because you know, you're a kid and your mom's gone and you're being bombarded. But I knew why she was gone. When mom is gone at the middle of the night, she went to get water. Usually that was the reason. So I grabbed my brother, I grabbed a blanket, I grabbed a candle and we sat in the hallway, which was the middle of our apartment because it was the safest place. It had the most walls around us. That, that was what mom and dad told us, sit in the hallway, cover yourselves and don't move until we come back. Um, and my mom found us there sleeping on the bed or on the, on the floor in the hallway um, after she came back from her water trip. Uh, and, and this was this was all the time. So this is just a one-time thing that I wanted to share. Um, in July of 1995, when Srebrenica fell, I was nine, and I remember everyone crying when we heard the news. And you know, I really, at the time, I didn't understand the gravity of what had happened. I mean, I was nine years old. I knew that there was a war. I thought it was just, you know, casualties from the war. Even then, that was awful. Um, and then you have people trying to convince you, no, it wasn't really, it's not what they're saying. This is just a war. It's a civil war. You know, people chose to fight and, you know, people die in civil war. And this was this propaganda machine at work again, trying to convince us that we didn't really know what had happened to us. Um, and as time went on and we found out what had been done in Srebrenica and elsewhere around Bosnia, um, the realization starts to set in that, you know, this is not what they're saying. Uh, this was truly what we thought it was. And it was an attack on, on, on faith, on, 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 on the Muslims, Bosnian Muslims of the country. Um, and, and when you look at uh, the way that people were killed, especially in Srebrenica, I mean, Srebrenica says 8,372 men and boys were killed within a few days. And in the way that they were killed, they were hunted like animals you know, through the woods, they would, they were killed in mass and buried in mass graves. And then when, when the international community figured out what had happened, then they created secondary mass graves where they went and they dug up the bodies that they had buried to dismember them, to, to, to make sure that the bodies are not in one piece. And then to bury half of that in another grave site, which were called secondary mass graves. And I recently did an interview with, um, uh, Mr. Robert McNeil, who uh, wrote a book about this as a forensic technician, where he collected evidence of genocide in Bosnia, and he talks about what it was like piecing all of this together and finding out what had been done to these people. Um, so that, you know, the mass graves on top of, and, and this was happening all over, right? Srebrenica was sort of the culmination of everything, but we had this in Priedor and Foča and Tuzla and many other places across the country that they, where they did this. Um, and so this on top of the rape camps, uh, the, the premeditated and pre-planned uh, murder uh, of people across the country just points that, you know, this was an attack on, a, on an entire group of people. And, and Srebrenica is the only place where it was recognized as a genocide, um, you know, due to the, the varying evidence in, in other places. Um, so, you know, for me personally, the war and especially Srebrenica made me question a lot of things uh, in my life after arriving in the United States in 1999. I started researching what had really happened. I started researching Islam, right? You start wondering like, you know, wh why did they attack my faith? What is happening here? I started researching Islamophobia at a very young age and questioning sort of everything I knew to make sure that what I believe is what I believe, right? It's one of those, you go through this process of um, trying to understand why what happened to you happened to you. Um, and, and it also, as I read more, I became more committed to talk to more people. So then I started having debates with people about Islam and Srebrenica and the war and correcting ne people's negative perception of the faith. Um, I was determined to become an ambassador to, to say, look, this is not, you know, this faith is not the way that they looked at it. It is not the way that today we're trying to be painted. Um, you know, that this is a problem and it needs to stop. And it's the same thing that was done to the Jewish people 
and, and it also needs to stop, you know, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, they go hand in hand in my book. Um, and after all that research, I very quickly realized that, you know, being a white European Muslim was a threat to the current world, world, world order um, who tried to label Muslims, you know, once again, the way that they labeled the Jews. Um, and, and today, unfortunately, that is still happening based on what I, what I just presented before I started. Um, and, you know, the Croat president, Mr. Jelko Komisic, who is one of the three member uh, presidents in Bosnia and Herzegovina, said yesterday that everything foreign uh, dignitaries are currently doing in Bosnia is first and foremost anti-Islamic. Um, you know, and the fact that we have to end a remembrance program in fear as tensions rise once again in Bosnia is unfathomable and perplexing in and of itself. Um, so I hope that the world remembers Srebrenica. I hope that the 8,732 men and boys who gave their lives on July 11th, 1995 and, and the days following are our guiding light um, to ensure that fascism, wherever it shows its face, we slap it back um, in its place. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the time to, to share this with you today. Thank you so much, um, Sama. I mean, I'm sitting here with like shivering, literally listening to you. Um, as you know, I've been to all those places and paid my respect, even in Tuzla when I was there and I saw where, you know, 80 men were just murdered um, in the streets, right? Um, and, you know, as, as somebody, as I said, that I teach the Holocaust, this is so reminiscent of the evil that we can do to each other. Um, and how how those memories are still there with you. So I can I can't even relate to be honest, but I I I can at least understand the historical and the the fact that we must remember and also understand in context like you you uh, you pointed out what actually happened and try to speak up when there are those deniers out there. Um, in terms of genocide. So next, I'd like to uh, have to hear from Sonia. We introduced you earlier, um, but I'm really, really uh, very excited to hear your story. Thank you. I think you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Sonia, you need to unmute. So if you see the vol the volume, you know, button, eh? yeah. this is yeah. okay. Yes, you're okay. on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I I'll tell you, <laughs> it it's much easier. And if you like, I can tell, uh, send you by mail if you like to print this this short story. I'm member of uh, one uh, very old Sephardi family from Spain, which uh, came in the Ottoman Empire and stay there till today. I am born uh, like refugee in Zenica after Second World War. And uh, my mother, father, and older sister survived with some miracles. And of course, uh, with, with the good people, <laughs> with help of good people. Uh, they are lost uh, 156 person from uh, Call both large families. And uh, I'm growing up with tears, with um, research from some information, who was killed in which concentration came few, you, you know, no, nobody. My mother lost everybody. She never sing. And uh, uh, they they wait with somebody come in Sarajevo to tell who, who survived some some camp. Did you met my mother, my brother? My that was a terrible uh, kids was killed in uh, in the concentration camp in Nova Gar Gradishka. My relatives was uh, 30, 12, and 11. Sonia was 11, and they was killed in Nova Gradishka. And uh, that's the that is this uh, sad story, and when war started in 1992, I had an apartment on Grbavica. That part was occupied, and I work in energy investing export. And in one day, I lost my apartment. I lost my job, and came in my parents' house 
in downtown and if you, in a few days that's uh, uh, burned because army go on the on the street with the tanks and I don't know what they do. At that time, that day, they they burn a main office, a post office, a big library, city hall. This is Vietnamese, and um, I know that my father died two years before before a war. And I know that he should be very sad because gone fire Oriental Institute and a lot of valuable books and the documents, everything was lost. And uh, when, I, when I lost everything, a, a Jewish community organized organize a lot of uh, convoys for, for, for ladies, kids, old people. But I decided to stay in Sarajevo and voluntary in Jewish community. That was a terrible time because we didn't have what Selma says. We didn't have a glass on windows. We didn't have electricity, gas, water, food, medicines, nothing. And uh, maybe, I, I cannot remember, maybe that was a 1993 start, some humanitarian aid from, from, from Split and get to million permissions to come in Sarajevo and we got some, uh, some food and medicines. We are really gave to all citizens from Sarajevo and all refugees who came in Sarajevo. We all, all of us was uh, brothers and sisters in the same situation. Jewish community gave a lot of medicines to hospitals and opened three uh, pharmacy stores and one ambulance with two or three doctors to help somebody. That was a terrible, you, you couldn't go out. You don't know, will sniper kill you? Will some grenade, uh, will, will... And we, we have to go to bring water. Every morning early before, before, uh, before, when, how to explain? When it's fog, I have to pass one bridge. And my sister and me, I was a refugee, and in the end, I live in my sister's apartment. And we, we at six o'clock in the morning, we uh, pass a bridge and go to, to take water. How many liters of water? If you have a 50 liters of water, you are a very rich person. And I remember winter, 93, you have a glass and all ice is, is here and on the pants also. And when you are a refugee, you don't have adequate <laughs> clothes and shoes and everything. That was a terrible. And uh, the Taibaka, when they, when they destroy own city and fire all city and fire all these books, I say, this is a crystal macht game. What is this in the end of the 20th century? What's happened? And uh, we didn't have electricity, but some news came in Sarajevo. We had some tiny, some people, some with some permission pass, and we got some, some information. And when, when uh, happened this terrible thing in, in Srebrenica, I was so sad, so horrified. I say, why again? Why again? Why? this man uh, do deserve to somebody or you say take arm um, you know and say that Srebrenica is protect zone and then they leave them that they that they executioners do you, do you understand me none of us couldn't trust uh, with con which country, city, family will, will be born and what color will be, with, with, which nationality and which, uh, which religious. I always say that I know only two groups of people, good or bad. And uh, I, I, I really don't know why, why, why some, some, some sick uh, mind can, can, can think on, on different ways. 
and the uh, you probably know this I have to read <laughs> maybe Selma will will will, uh, will, will uh, help me to translate because this is very important to, to tell you this is too difficult <laughs> for me <laughs> just a moment excuse me um da je muslimansko jevrijski twinning održan 2018. So you're probably familiar that uh, the Muslim and Jewish twinning happened in 2017 and 18. And na inicijativu jevrijske zajednice Bosne i Hercegovine. Initiated by the Jewish community in Bosnia. Mi, mi imamo uh, među religijsko i među kulturalno vijeće. We have a, vrlo uh, aktivno. We have a um, uh, uh, multi uh, or, or multi faith and multicultural organization that is very active in in Sarajevo. Jevrejska uh, zajednica Bosne i Hercegovine sa svjetskim jevrejskim kongresom aktivno radi na podizanju svijesti o genocidu u Srebrenicu. The Jewish, the Jewish community in, in Sarajevo is actively working with the World Jewish Congress in raising awareness about the genocide in Srebrenica. And thank you for that, Sonia. And the, in the end, I like only one sentence. I, everything what's happened in Sarajevo, you know, like me. I like to tell you, because I don't have a lot of family, except my daughter and my two granddaughters, I have a brother and sister. And uh, all my there people who I like, I adopt like my relatives, and I have a lot of Muslim relatives. That's it. Thank you so much, um, Sonia. Um, so I mean, I'm listening to both of you, and I'm reminded of a fantastic documentary that's called The Woman from Sarajevo. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, and it's a documentary, and I'm just gonna give you the basic sort of idea of the documentary and the message. It's about how during World War II, the Bosnian Muslims helped Jews when it was under fascism, right? Under the Nazis escape. And, you know, time forward, right? We're going to 90, 92, 93, that the Jewish community in Sarajevo remembered. And at that time, even though Jews were persecuted, they helped Bosnian families also escape. It's a beautiful story, especially for the sisterhood, right? In terms of that arc of understanding and that, that understanding that the Jews were indeed in Sarajevo, right? And that they are still in Sarajevo and that they are Part of the fabric. Yes, Sonia. If I can add one, one sentence, I, I, I now remember. A lot of Muslim family protects the Jews and they got, uh, got uh, some medal in Yad Vashem. Among the writers, yeah. Jewish community never forget it. Uh, I don't know, do you know, for Miss Hardaga. She uh, saved her neighbor. And after that, all her family moved to Israel and president of Israel gave her to Israeli passport. Her daughter and granddaughter still now live in, in Israel. But uh, uh, the Jewish community had a lot of convoys to leave Sarajevo. And, uh, you know, border was at a stoop. You know, where to, this is maybe five tram station. This is a city. But the Serbs stayed there and you couldn't pass. And then when we make a list in Jewish community, all of us brought identity card of our parents, aunt, everybody who died and give that and they leave Sarajevo with Jewish names and till split, in split okay. collecting this uh, identity card back in Sarajevo. <laughs> Next month, new group of Muslim people leave Sarajevo with uh, uh, un, un Jewish names. 
We, we are, Sarajevo is together, we are friends and family, I tell you. I have a lot of Muslims <laughs> relatives and we are, we are best friends and uh, we, we, we are here to, we you know, uh, centuries, to be a good neighbors, to be good friends, to be like brothers and help each other. Still mm -hmm. now I have here first neighbors, one Muslim family that was a Corona. I was close at home two, two months. Uh, this young man, he has two little kids and a lot of obligation. He got uh, bell on the door and asked me what I need to buy you. And we are friends. That's beautiful, yeah. So, I mean, I wanna, I just wanna back up a little bit, you know, as somebody who believes in history, um, I'm not sure the audience, and this is for you, Selma, if you can explain this, understands what happened in 1992, why the war did break out. Um, as you, as I hope that the audience knows that, you know, uh, it, Yugoslavia was, it was one country, right? And it was ruled um, as a nation. Um, they had a, Tito was the, in charge. And then what happened? Can you explain just in about... Five, five minutes because I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't to be, how to say, to lose my blast. Yeah, they wanted and to take over power. They started uh, fighting. But yeah. the biggest problem was that Milosevic be on the top of, uh, of the Serbia. And the Serbs always has a big dream to have a big Serbia, if it's possible, till Tokyo. And they, 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 every, look, that was a big Serbia, now is a Serb world what say Vucic, this is the same thing. And uh, now today I watch a uh, TV, uh, some, some, something on TV, a lady from Belgrade is a happy Serbia. She walk on, on Banja Luka and show Banja Luka like Serbia. You cannot believe how they adopt uh, little by little. And that's them dream to be, uh, to have a big Serbia. This is like little Hitler. You know, Hitler didn't like Jews, Serbs don't like Muslims, and everybody together who is not Serb. Mm -hmm. I think Absolutely. this is short my opinion. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, just to give a, a bit more, you know, the, the historical aspect, right? You had a, a, a grapple for power, right? Yugoslavia splits up, um, you know, other countries declare independence uh, from Yugoslavia, Serbia, Croatia. Uh, Bosnia holds a referendum in 92 to say, hey, let's to come out, let's take a vote and see if we would like to also be an independent nation, which, you know, Bosnia was, was an independent kingdom um, for centuries, even before Yugoslavia, which is something that Serbs uh, like to deny as part of this denial culture. Um, and so then, you know, after 92, people come out, they vote, um, Bosnia, the majority says, yes, let's, let's have our own country. We would like to declare independence the way the United States did from the UK. I mean, this is the same type of concept. And Milosevic and, and Serbia go, nope, that's not happening. Bosnia is part of Serbia. Uh, it has to stay part of Serbia. Now that it's not Yugoslavia, it'll be greater Serbia, like Sonia said. And um, they begin a war of aggression attacking Bosnia um, to make sure that we do not secede what, we, what they considered seceding from Yugoslavia rather than um, you know, declaring our independence, which is what we did, um, which other countries were allowed to do, right? But then you know, when, when um, Serbs didn't just attack Bosnia, right? They went on, they, they fought the Croatians, they attacked Kosovo. They were gonna go on and see how much of Southeast yes. Europe, they could get under this greater Serbia idea. Um, and, and so that's kind of the background. I don't want to go too much into detail. It's such a long story, like, the details of what happened, but that's sort of the big picture. I hope that ends up. They pretend on the Montenegro and Macedonia also. Yes. Yeah. Yep. No, I, that's perfect. Um, I just wanted people to know the expansion and what happened. Yugoslavia broke up and then there was this um, need to nationalize not too dissimilar from what we're seeing in terms of uh, looking at 
Russia right now and taking over Ukraine. But let me just move to one more question. And I think we'll, we're gonna uh, break into groups, uh, Nicole. So just the last question I have, Selma, and you know, I just came back from Sarajevo as we were talking, but what is going on in um, the new discriminatory law that you described in the beginning? Can you tell us what that law is about? Um, because I have sort of discovered that there's a lot of denial and there's a rise of real fascism right now. That's why I had to go this year um, to support um, the Bosnians, but also the intellectuals that are working so hard, the artists that are working so hard in Bosnia. So can you tell us a little bit about that law? Yeah, yeah. So and this is this is such a broad topic. I'm going to take a little bit of a step back to understand why there is a need for the law. Um, so when when the war ended, the reason it ended was because the international community finally got involved after, you know, the three years of war and said, this is enough, especially after they saw Srebrenica and what happened in Srebrenica, they had to do something. Um, so they threatened to bomb uh, um, Serbia and Serbs if the war continues, um, the war ended. They had um, went to Dayton, Ohio. They signed what they called the Dayton Accords, they, peace accords. These were meant to be, um, it was meant to end the peace and, and that it did. And it had a constitution that was part of these accords. It was meant to be sort of temporary, right? Let's put a constitution in place in this country uh, that will hold the country together while they figure out how to move forward. But the constitution set up an extremely complex system of government where you have three presidents who rotate. Um, and each of those presidents represents a, an ethnic group of people within Bosnia that was defined by the Dayton. So there are three constituent peoples that were defined in the Dayton. Um, there are the Bosnian Croats, the Bosnian Serbs, and what they called the Bosniaks. I wanna point this out here because it's really important. Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Serbs are called out by their nationality, right? They're originally from Croatia, therefore they're Croats. They're originally from Serbia, therefore they're Serbs. The Bosniaks are identified by their faith. Bosniak currently today means a Bosnian Muslim. Um, so I just want everybody to think about that a little bit, why that was done. Um, and the other interesting point on the topic of Bosniaks is the word Bosniak is actually much older than Yugoslavia. It was used by the Ottomans to describe the people that lived in this region. And it included everyone that lived in the country of Bosnia. Bosniak was our old name. This is what we identified as regardless of our faith, right? So they adopted that old name and they said, no, this is just for Bosnian Muslims, right? When they did this referendum and all of that is complicated. I don't want to get into details with that. So then what happened? The Dayton, um, as I mentioned, set up three presidents and um, two entities within, within Bosnia. So Bosnia became two states, essentially, uh, the federation and then the smaller entity of Republika Srpska. Um, so they're not states, but they're kind of two entities. And okay. um, there's, a, there's a president. Oh, sorry. There's a president. Percent. Percent. Yeah. Yes. So um, there's a president of Republika Srpska, and then there are two presidents from Federacija, one that's supposed to represent the Croat uh, population and one that's supposed to represent the Bosniak population. Um, what happened recently, right, you had Mr. Željko Komšić, who I quoted earlier when I was talking about my background, um, who is a Croat Catholic who was voted in by um, a, a large majority of both um, Croats and Bosniaks because the man is a defender of the, the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. He doesn't like nationalism. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about that stuff. He is not a genocide denier. He, he knows what happened in Srebrenica. And so for him, um, for him to get elected by Muslims was not okay with HDZ, which is the sort of fascist party representing the Croat population in Bosnia. So when he got elected, they said, no, 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 no. Muslims cannot elect moderate Croat Catholics in power because they do not represent our opinions because they're fascist. Um, so now they started pressuring the international community to pass a law to allow only Croats to vote for Croats, right? To, to segregate people even further. What's worse, the current Dayton constitution does not allow a Jewish person or a Roma person to run for office, to run for presidency, which is outrageous. And it's because they created three constituent peoples. Mm -hmm. Only three constituent peoples can be represented. So uh, Mr. Sa uh, Mr. Finsey, Mr. Mr. Um, Derwa Sejdic went to the um, human rights 
courts. They challenged this in the courts. The court said, yes, this constitution is discriminatory. It needs to change. But you have a three part presidency with three different presidents representing three different peoples. Of course, they're not gonna agree on passing new laws to ensure that this is not discriminatory because everyone is pulling in their own direction. Um, so now this new law is specifically focused on electoral reform. So rather than trying to change the entire constitution, which we know is discriminatory, uh, we're saying we're just going to change the electoral law and we're going to do it eight to 10 weeks or eight weeks before the elections. And we're going to say that, you know, first of all, unless you have 3% of your population in any part of the country, you will not be allowed to have a, a parliamentary person represent you. So if you are a minority and you don't have more than 3%, you're pretty much discarded. So what's gonna happen in effect, and I wanna explain, and this is just one of the provisions, there are many other concerning provisions, this is one of them. What's gonna happen is you're gonna have people who are minorities move to places in order to be able to vote, in order to be able to, well, you can vote, but in order to be represented, right? In effect, they're finishing what they started in the 90s. The Muslims moving with the Muslims, the Serbs with the Serbs, the Croats with the Croats, and you're finishing what you started and you're doing it legally and you're doing it with the backing of the international community and it is flabbergasting so that's i mean i hope i was able to explain it's a it's a big topic <laughs> um, yeah. that was great so much thank you so much and um thank you so much sonia i mean it's just there's so much to do um and talk about maybe we could do like another one in a few months just to see what's going on, but also like, you know, I think people need the education for sure in terms of what happened in, in Bosnia, but also what's happening today in Eastern Europe. It's a very important spot. And a lot of, I find as a professor that my students don't know anything about Eastern Europe. Um, all they think of is like Warsaw and black and white photos of the destruction of World War II. That's their image. They don't know anything about Bosnia. They don't know anything about even the Ukraine, right? So here you have this massive, you know, um, part of the world that most people don't even think and, and talk about. And that's something really important um, to think about because we're always focused on Western Europe, right? Yep. So I really appreciate um, you coming. And Nicole, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, so we're going to go into breakout rooms. I know our speakers have other engagements today, so unfortunately, they're not going to be able to stay for those um, breakout rooms. But anyone who would like to participate, um, we ask that you in the breakout rooms reflect on what you've heard today. How does it um, affect you personally? What does it mean to you personally? You know, share a little bit about what's happened in Bosnia and how that's reflective upon our own life and what we can do to ensure this doesn't happen again. Um, I think that's that's the big thing is to really remember that this can happen anywhere and it's not um, it's not a unique situation. It's happened before and it will happen again, unfortunately. So reflect on that in those breakout rooms and um, Let's have some great discussions and, and see where those go. And then we'll come back into the room and, and just share some of those, those thoughts and reflections. Thelma, Sonia, thank you so much. I told you the other day when we had an opportunity to speak that I could literally sit and talk to you both for hours and hours, weeks and weeks. It is an thank honor you. to have you both. Um, we're, we're just so blessed to have had you both here. Thank you so much. Thank you to call me. Thank you. Write me. I, this is the big honor for me. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And Mehnez, you're amazing for stepping in. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, Always my pleasure to help you know, your sister. Yeah. We, we really do. So let me open up the breakout rooms now. Um, I'm going to open up five rooms. So there should be three to four people per room. Um, please feel free to um, share your thoughts and feelings while you're there. to them again. 
So thank you everyone for coming. I know not many of you um, chose to stay for the breakout rooms, but I love that a few of you did and hopefully it was fulfilling to be able to talk in the breakout rooms. Sonia did decide to stay with us. So we're very fortunate that she's still here. If anyone has any questions for Sonia directly that you'd like to um, put into the chat or ask directly, you can virtually raise your hand um, and I'd be happy to do that. Would anyone like to share what they discussed in the breakout room? Um, if so, also raise your hand. Um, so um, that would be great. Ah, Fern, I'm so glad. I was hoping you would, Fern. Let me ask you to unmute and I will add you. Okay, so I was waiting to see if Deborah was going to say something as she was in the room, but um, I, I uh, and, and Sonia, you might have an answer for us as well, or at least some guide, guidance. Um, what, I mean, obviously both of our hearts, or, and, and Betcha doesn't have a microphone, so, um, we we really our hearts were are broken with over the story and i i know one of the reasons i sponsored this was because um i have a friend the lady who does my eyebrows is bosnian and she lost her mother and we talked about it and when the ukraine war started she said the world didn't pay attention to us for far too long and my heart broke because here Ukraine is getting the attention and well deserved, obviously, but there are so many other places and, and, you know, we can't undo what we didn't, the world didn't do in Bosnia or Serbia, but in that whole conflict, but anyway, um, so we, we were talking and we were talking about what can we do and what um, how we can help. And the one thing that I have said is that the sisterhood is really a path. I mean, because we do come together. What really touched my heart, Sonia, was when you said the Jews did not forget. And when the Muslims were the primary focus, the Jews stood with them. And that is the sisterhood. And so as a unit, we are stronger together how we have to make sure we maintain that and that we grow it. So would you, is there anything concrete that you can say that we can do regarding the situation there, which we're watching and as we discussed, we're watching our own situation of losing, potentially using democracy and, and seeing how close we came to that earlier, you know, last year. Thank you so much. And uh, I understand you. you. You cannot believe how much you, I understand you. Uh, my heart is broken always when I see on TV that is war anywhere. When war starts in Ukraine, three days I'm sitting in front of TV, look at uh, these refugees with kids, and uh, all movie back. But now I'm 30 years older. I'm three days sitting and cry and look at them. I know we are survive all of this, but and look, Selma has this experience. Tahir is has this, this experience. I don't know is this destiny of Balkan and what's happened, but my heart is always broke when I see. Uh, in Africa, anywhere, when I see a war and people leave them house, all war, all life, all your life, you try to, to have something. In, the, in 24 hours, if you can take one plastic bag, you are a rich, rich person. Can you believe that I leave my apartment in only one bra? Uh, that's it. You have 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or you 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 will be you will be killed that's it it's a lot yeah. but what to do that's life life is not easy but it's necessary to be positive and be brave nicole i agree yeah that's, that's great words of wisdom yeah 
we have to be hopeful, positive, brave. I think that's those are really important lessons to take away from. Today. I'm almost 77, and my life story is very, very long and not not very funny. <laughs> but I'm here. Um, Vera, I'm going to bring you in and we'll ask uh, one last question. So give me one moment. Okay, I'm going to ask you to unmute. I don't know, am I uh, 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 say a right answer because I'm not sure if, if my you did. <laughs> if you did. is not close, I'm scared. No, you did. It was great. Go ahead, Vera. You have a question? Yeah, so I just wanted to say it's not so much a question, but a kind of an observation and a, and a hope or suggest slash suggestion is that if we could only get more of our sisterhood uh, members' eyes on these um, kinds of opportunities to learn. Um, I mean, honestly, I just maybe it was sent to me several times and I overlooked it, but I just noticed it in the last couple of days in an email. So I signed up, you know, really last minute. I'm, I'm in transit. So I um, want to listen to it again, but, but more fundamentally, I have a sisterhood meeting, um, in an hour and a half, I live in California and, uh, you know, there's already a program for today, but just to figure out how to get more of our sisterhood to, um, be able to, um, appreciate and, and listen to the, the programming, this wonderful programming, which is so, it's so important that that would be, I mean, even apart from the bigger community, our own sisterhood across the country, you know, Thank that's you. all. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we, we actually have sent this out um, quite a number of times and we have it posted to our website. It's been in all of our newsletters. We had quite a large response to this program. Um, so we were really grateful for that and it will be posted to our website. So uh, anyone who's interested in having an opportunity to view this and watch it again, uh, it will be posted to our website. So thank you for that, Vera, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna end the program for today. Thank you, Sonia, thank you. so much for staying and for joining. Thank you, my dear sisters. You have been <laughs> wonderful. We love you. And I would, like I said, I would spend- It's much better that you are my granddaughters. But oh, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. That made my whole day. That made my whole day. I'm really just, just tickled. So thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you for staying and participating in our event. Uh, this event will be posted to our website please check it out. It's sosspeace.org. And if you care to sponsor future programs like this, please contact Samantha at sosspeace.org. And thank you again. Can you, can you send me this uh, website by mail? I will. I will definitely you know do that. how much I know. <laughs> I will definitely do that. And thank you to Fern Finkel for sponsoring today's program. Uh, we really appreciate all of your hard work and your continued support of the sisterhood. Thank, thank you, you everyone. So Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.